content that gets their attention, many of them won't change. Is it possible for people to change if they don't go through some type of painful, dramatic event? Well, you know, there's a saying, the teacher comes when the student's ready. Mm -hmm. If the student's not ready, uh, it's hard to change. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, you know, there's certainly instances where somebody like wakes up one day and they go, I don't like this, you know, I feel horrible. And, you know, I just ruined this relationship. I need to have a, a, an internal mm -hmm. um, assessment of myself and talk to some people and to give me insight. Yes, you can do that, uh, but it's hard. And it, even for me, uh, as an example, as a child, I learned a, sort of a manifestation technique from a woman in a magic shop. And this is actually about my first book, which is called Into the Magic Shop, a Neurosurgeon's Quest to Discover the Mysteries of the Brain and the secrets of the heart. And that story is about my own childhood growing up in poverty with an alcoholic father and a mother who had had a stroke when I was a child, wow. uh, was partially paralyzed, uh, had a seizure disorder, and chronically depressed sure. and attempted suicide multiple times. And wow. we were on public assistance. Well, you know, you can imagine overcoming that baggage is very, very hard. And, uh, uh, but, this is also an example of how one person can intervene and change somebody's life. And so what happened was I had an interest in magic and, uh, and thus the, actually the name of this book is My Magic. Uh, and it ended up when my parents would, some event would happen, which was traumatic. I would get on my bicycle and ride as far and as fast away as I could. And uh, I ended up at a strip mall and there's a magic shop there. And I walked in and there was a woman there who was, as I described, this radiant person with this incredible smile whose very presence embraced her when I was 12. Wow. And I was filled with despair, hopelessness. And uh, it turned out she was the owner's mother. She knew nothing about magic. Really? Yes. But we began a conversation and, uh, uh, and she was giving me chocolate chip cookies. Uh, <laughs> Which was great. Uh, exactly what you needed at that time. <laughs> But the thing is, she asked me actually some uh, personal questions, which frankly, uh, you know, who wants to tell somebody you're poor, your father's not caught it? But I answered her questions, and after a while she said to me, she said, you know, I really like you. I think I can teach you something that could really help you. And what she taught me was what we would now call a mindfulness practice. Mm. Because as you know, uh, talking about baggage, when you grow up in a unpredictable, chaotic environment, you're essentially in a war zone every day. Yes. As a result, it chronically stimulates your sympathetic nervous system or your flight, fight, or fear response. And what happens is that affects your brain in the sense that it cuts down options because you're looking at the shortest distance you have to go to survive. As a result, you can never relax. You're always fidgety. You're always looking around because you never know what's going to happen next. So she taught me a uh, technique of what we call a body survey now, how to relax your body. Mm -hmm. And uh, then she taught me how to concentrate, in this case, by looking at a candle and doing a breathing exercise. And these are the fundamental techniques associated with the mindfulness practice because yes. it, then it shifts you from engagement of your sympathetic nervous system to engagement of your parasympathetic nervous system, which is really where we should live. You're open, you're thoughtful, you have access to your executive control areas in the brain in terms of memory and experience, and uh, you're much more creative. Mm. And so when you're able to make that shift, that changes how you look at the world. The other problem is from these types of backgrounds, but I would say essentially everyone, we have a negative dialogue going on in our head. An inner critic. Yes, and as much as, you know, people say, you know, I always ask this question when I give a talk, and, you know, almost everybody raises their hand, and then this and you go, look, dude, you're lying. <laughs> everybody has an inner critic. It's just some are much more powerful uh, than others. And uh, so she also taught me to recognize that that wasn't truth. The inner critic. Yes, because if you, uh, and being an athlete, I'm sure you know, uh, if you tell yourself it's not possible, by definition, it is not possible. It cannot happen. And so when people listen to that, they are giving their self-agency away. And in some ways, uh, this is the nature of how we take control of our manifestation. Uh, and uh, as you know from the first sentence of the book, 
Mm -hmm. It says the universe doesn't give a about you because it has no to give. There is not some external entity deciding your fate because you're a good or a bad guy. But we have immense power within us to control our destiny. Mm. And when you give it away and listen to that critic, then you're limiting your beliefs. So the key is how do you uh, unlimit your beliefs, if you will. And that is understanding the incredible power you have within yourself. When you sit there and say every day, I'm not worthy, I don't deserve love, it's not possible, I'm an imposter, I can't do it. It's as if you're building a prison for yourself with bricks. Wow. And the wall gets higher and it gets darker and you feel more and more powerless. And you feel like there's some external force controlling your life. When you understand within you is an incredible power to change your destiny and you have that power and finally you recognize it, then extraordinary things can happen. And this is how you go from you being in charge or uh, let's say a belief that others are in charge to actually you being in charge. But how did, I mean, how did you learn to break free of the limiting beliefs that you had and the fight or flight symptoms that you were constantly in, which I felt as a kid as well, uh, and felt very insecure, stupid, and unlovable for many different reasons, and I was able to back it with beliefs and evidence throughout my childhood. How did you learn to break the limiting beliefs and, and create more empowering beliefs to support you to feel emotionally free and start to attract more of what you wanted in your life? Well, first of all, uh, I don't want to imply that that journey's done. Right. Hey, yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes people look at you and they go, man, you have it all together now. You, none of us have it all together, right? Every one of us is still a frail, fragile human being who is struggling. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, some of us are a little further on that journey, others are continue to have difficulty. But uh, interacting with this woman made me see the world through a different lens. Because when you have negative statements that you tell yourself repeatedly, as I said, that takes away your agency, yes. your own power. You feel powerless. Yes, and, and but the thing is, then when you're beating up yourself, and you're typically the most critical person of yourself than anyone you know, then you look through the lens of being critical to everyone else. Interesting. Yes. So when we are critical of ourselves, does that support us in creating great relationships with others? No, oftentimes it's a very damaging because you're always thinking of, oh, well, they're going to cheat on me. They're going to lie because you're telling yourself these types of narratives. Yeah. And so uh, it's hard to be authentic. When you're critical of self. Yes, yes. and and. This goes back to a whole nother discussion, if you will, about if you look at the blue zones, as an example, I, obviously we're jumping around all sure, over the sure, place sure. here, but if Mama you, Linda's right down the street in yeah, an hour away, yeah. one of the blue zones. Yes, right? of course. Uh, but if you look at uh, the blue zones, or you look at the work of uh, the Harvard Longevity or Adult Development Study, it's yeah, called, yeah. but this is the work of Robert Waldinger. Centuries ago, when we lived in villages, um, we were born there. Uh, we had a community that even with our flaws still loved us and mm -hmm. watched out for us and wow. taught us lessons. We had our parents, our siblings, our grandparents in proximity to us. And the very nature of that, actually, uh, you don't have that negative dialogue going on, okay? Mm -hmm. It is the negative dialogue that's extraordinarily unhealthy. Uh, because you see, when you're always stressed and anxious and negative towards yourself, well, what does this do? This stimulates your sympathetic nervous system, which then does what? It results in the production of uh, inflammatory proteins, which of course are associated with chronic disease states. It depresses your immune system. Uh, it increases the levels of stress hormones like cortisol, which on a chronic basis are very bad for you your cardiac function's impaired, your blood pressure's increased. So all these negative aspects are activated when you're constantly hypercritical. Wow. Right? And then you don't feel that good. Right. You feel tired, you feel yeah. exhausted, drained. And the other aspect is, as an example with my own parents, I used to have a sense that it wasn't that I wasn't loved, but I was ignored. Uh, I couldn't understand why they would do these actions. And I was angry all the time. 
And when I changed how I looked at the world, it made me much more sympathetic and kind because I realized everyone is suffering on some level. And the issue wasn't that they didn't care. The issue was they had not had tools to help themselves. To heal, to process, to <laughs> regulate. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, I'm sure you've known people, you watch them go through their lives and they constantly struggle because no one has ever shown them a different way. And that's the only way. And sometimes, as I think you're probably thinking, yes, I've shown them a thousand but times, not, they don't listen. They're not willing. Yeah. Yes. They've got to be willing to apply, well, right? Back to the question of the teacher. If they're, if they're ready to, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But the reason I was saying that, though, is that uh, in many ways sets the stage for how you're going to respond. So this interaction with this woman, I was able to self-regulate. She I taught was able, you skills. Yes, she taught me a mindfulness practice. And you were ready for it. Exactly. And so I realized once I was able to relax, once I was able to be present and attend, because you can't learn anything or change if your mind's always somewhere, right? In my example of growing up, you know, I never knew what was going to happen. So I'm always worried about something happening to me. But the action is here between you and I. It's not about possibilities. And this also limits people's power, right? Because you, if you can't focus and attend, you can't accomplish, right? And if you're always distracted, mm. it's, it's not possible. So she taught me to relax. She taught me to be present. And, uh, and then strange things happen because you're feeling a different type of energy coming from others and, and yourself. And that energy has an influence. As an example, um, 